You are at a meeting of the Gilroy Unified School District. If that's not where you need to be, you're in the wrong place. So. <laughs> Um, we're going to start our meeting with the Pledge of Allegiance with Rucker Elementary School and Principal Christine Anderson. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you're doing it. Okay. Nice. Good evening, everyone. Um, I am very proud to introduce to you some of our very dedicated and awesome leadership students at, at Rucker, and their equally awesome and dedicated advisor and our fifth grade teacher, Miss Nikki um, Astacio. They have been prepared, and they are eager to lead you in the flag salute, so I'm going to turn it over to them. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Great job. Love your t-shirts. <laughs> okay, we have uh, approval of agenda, item 3B. Do I have a motion? Approval. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. And now we have recognitions. It's my honor this evening to do a very, very special recognition. And uh, this is really long overdue because the person we're gonna recognize has done so much for the Gilroy High Baseball program for so many years, but um, recently he did something just incredible. So I wanna ask Billy Holler to come up here. <laughs> Hi, Billy. Hi. You can stand over here. Right. <laughs> and I know you hate this kind of stuff. <laughs> it kind of it kind of took me to get him here. Other people had tried, but anyway, he's here, and we're really glad. And I I have some prepared comments, thanks to Dan and some of my own. So I'm going to try to stick to them. But anyway, those of you, many of uh, folks are here from Gilroy High tonight. I'm sure to support Billy, but. The varsity uh, field was literally unplayable uh, the, up till this past fall. It was in really, really poor condition. And there's a lot of reasons, heavy use, drought, gopher, squirrels, you know, lots of reasons. But it was in terrible uh, shape. And even though our grounds crew had done everything they could to renovate the field, uh, they, they, they did as much as they could with the limited resources that we had. So. Um, Billy came to my office, went, called me or texted me one morning, said, can you meet today? And I said, sure, uh, because uh, I'd seen the incredible impact he had on my son over a four-year period. And I knew that he'd, he had probably had a really good idea, and he did. So he came, and he offered to help. And so Billy worked with our, our uh, Dan in particular, but uh, it turned out to be our, basically our whole landscape crew in the end with three individual, individuals I'm gonna call out later. But um, they jointly came up with a plan and uh, developed a plan for completely renovating the field, which you can see in front of you now what it looks like today. So the, um, because of his generosity and um, um, incredible commitment to our student athletes, it made this field renovation possible because we'd never done anything like this in the district. And, and I, Dan should probably come up here, but um, 
for the district agreed to basically cede uh, the cost of, of the turf, everything else was covered by Billy and his company. So his company uh, and their equipment and their labor is why this project was able to happen. And by the way, we estimate his contribution to be well over $100,000 towards this project. We now have a baseball field that probably compares to college fields, if not better. And I've been on a lot of the other high school fields during the four years my son played. I can't think of one that's this nice. Can you? No. Yeah. <laughs> so we can proudly say Gilroy High, at least in our league, has the nicest field, exactly. baseball field. <laughs> that's the goal. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, actually, wasn't our turf from the where they get Levi yes. Stadium's yeah. turf? I mean, we have really incredible turf on this field. But anyway, he and as if that wasn't enough, guess what he's doing right now? He's why they're here. He's renovating the girls' softball field. I guess he felt. <laughs> and that should be done in a few days, I hear. Yep. Right? So that's incredible. Uh, you know, Billy owns a construction company, so he was able to do this by using his own equipment and his own employees at both our fields. And I see a lot of the guys are here, too, and the other coaches. So. We're just so grateful to Billy and his company. And I, I also want to mention again our landscape. This was one of the most incredible joint projects I think we've ever done, right, Dan? Where our people worked with an outside uh, company, so to speak, to do this incredible work, which will benefit our kids for a really long time. And I want to call out three of our folks, and I believe one of them's here tonight. Jesse Omedo, Kevin Erickson, and Marcel Gonzalez, who were very involved in this project. One of them was able to be here tonight. Which one? Jesse? <laughs> so we, did, we wanted to make sure we acknowledged our, our folks, too, because they did an amazing job on this project. And I guess it's kind of opened the doors for us now to learn. Now we've learned how to do this kind of work. So we're just so proud, uh, Billy, uh, for you taking the lead and pushing a little hard on me <laughs> initially uh, to get this done. But um, we want to give you this plaque presented to Billy Holler with warmest appreciation for your generous contribution and assistance in the renovation of the Gilroy High School baseball fields. We thank you for your support, Gilroy Unified School District Board of Education, February 1st, 2018. Thank you. And we do, we do have certificates for the three employees that, that were, they worked on this project every day. This pretty much was their job for a couple of months. So, and I, sorry, which one? Jesse. Jesse, sorry. Congratulations, Jesse. We really appreciate that your involvement in this project. And I know that our employees play a really significant role. The last thing I want to mention is, in the four years that we were involved in the program, I witnessed on a weekly, daily basis, Billy and his, his equipment and his people, his kids, <laughs> his sons, um, and not just family and his employees, but he taught the boys so many incredible things besides baseball. And uh, for that, I'll forever be grateful. Thank you. So really the only thing I got to say is thanks for allowing me to do this and be part of the community. I do it because I love your kids. Um, I love being part of tradition, and that school has a huge tradition, you guys. And uh, I was lucky enough to get involved in it. My kids went there. Um, 
I got coaches that went there. It's special, you guys. It's a special place to be. It's Gilroy High. So um, thank you for allowing me to, to do the things I do out there, be part of the community, better place. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming. They probably just came from practice. Yeah. Okay. What is he doing? Okay. All right. Now we have uh, 3D public comment. Do we have any? Okay. So. At this time, we are going to take a short recess and uh, go back into closed session, and we should be back uh, shortly. Thank you. We have one more board member coming. We are back in session, and we are going. To, we are on uh, item three E, report of action taken in closed session, and in closed session we have. Uh, four expulsions to act on. So the first one is case 201807. Move to expel. Second. second. So I have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Case 201809. Move to expel. Second. second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimously carries. Case 2018-10. Move to expel. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. Case 2018-11. Move to expel. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. Thank you. And now we have item 4A. So Daisy Sarate Osorio from T.J. Owen's early college, Gilroy Early College Academy, affectionately known Gekka. as Gekka. <laughs> Thank you for being patient with us, Daisy. Sorry. So. Cool. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, members of the board. Tonight I will be presenting on Dr. T.J. Owens Gilroy Early College Academy as well as Luigi Aprea Elementary School. Back in December, we had two main events. We had our winter formal as well as our holiday bake sale. Our winter formal was held in the Morgan Hill Community Center on December 1st. The theme was Starry Night and our ASB members actually created this beautiful <laughs> backdrop that resembled Van Gogh's The Starry Night. And students used it to take pictures in front of it. And after the dance, we didn't just throw it away. We actually um, hung it up in our APUS history room. So it's right there in the back, and it's really pretty. I am, I am in awe of the talent our ASB members possess. Um, our second event was the Holiday Bake Sale on December 2nd in downtown Gil Gilroy. Excuse me. Um, we sold anything from um, baked goods to popcorn. We actually sold out of popcorn, which really isn't a surprise. A lot of the students were stating how it was really delicious. So next time, you guys should totally come down and buy some. <laughs> um, January, we also didn't really have much since we just came back from our winter break. We were still kind of getting situated. And um, we had our um, intercession on January 9th, which since Gavilan College wasn't in session, we were just following um, our high school schedule. And then we jumped back into our regular session once college classes started on the 29th. We also participated on National School of Choice Week, which is a um, celebratory event that 
is destined to raise public awareness of the different K-12 education options, as well as spotlight the benefits of school choice. And what we did was we made posters um, where we had quotes from GECA students explaining why they chose to come to GECA, as well as why they liked being a GECA. And it was a really nice um, way for us to appreciate our school as well as appreciate the um, students and the environment we're in, because sometimes we, we um, really don't appreciate it enough. And Poetry Out Loud was held on January 25th. Students from all grades partook in it, and there were prizes for school winners, which our school winners um, I will be announcing in the next slide. So our school winners um, are, on, are on the left picture, the first left picture. And from left to right, we have our first place winner, Julissa Lopez, our second place winner, Clarissa Lara, and our third place winner, Cassandra Maita. And our first place winner actually won a $75 gift card. Our second and third place winner also received prizes of their own. February, we have a lot to look forward to. We have our Black Bear Diner fundraiser on the 7th. Um, President's Day is coming up, so we will be having the 16th and 19th of February off. And um, the Chipotle fundraiser will be on the 20th. Our spring dance, also known as Sadie Hawkins, will be on the 23rd. And we will also be having military presentations on different career choices that the Army and the Navy has to offer. Additionally, we will also be um, having a social media presentation through the district attorney's office on how to use social media in a appropriate manner. Moving on to Luigi Elementary School. Luigi had its first musical production, Ms. Yama and the Three Unicorns, in December. And it was produced completely by the students. That means that the students wrote the lyrics, they um, wrote the script, and they also created the props. Local heroes such as policemen and firemen came to visit Luigi on January to um, read to the students. This was the second of three family literacy nights that Luigi um, has to offer. The third one will be in April, where students will be um, putting on a poetry night. Looking forward, Luigi is currently involved in the Kindness, Kindness Challenge this week and next week. So students and staff are challenged to, sorry, are challenged to um, partake in 50 acts of kindness. And Luigi will also be having a family workshop next week for all families of students with IEPs. And this um, will be put on by Parents Helping Parents, where families will learn how to organize all materials into a comprehensive folder for their student. And this concludes my presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Good job. Now we have 4B, Superintendent's Report. Thank you. Um, last week, I attended the AXA Superintendent Symposium, and the title or the, the theme of the conference this year is Leading Courageously. So, over a two and a half day period, I attended numerous workshops with that theme, and probably the most exciting ones were uh, two keynote speakers that talked about what's happening in the area of technology uh, in our world right now and the impact it could have on education over the next 10 to 15 years. So it was very, very informative. Um, on Monday, January 22nd, we had our, another session with the GTA for negotiations, and we have a session coming up next week on February 9th. We had our annual board retreat this past Saturday. So annually, there's a picture of us. Annually, on a Saturday, very early, on a Saturday morning, we get up with a facilitator and we have a retreat. And then that same day, Ms. Pacino and I went over to the Mid-Cal Wrestling Tournament, and we got to give out awards to very sweaty wrestlers. <laughs> it was fun. But anyway, um, Gilroy High, by the way, placed third, and the top uh, teams in the state were there. So that is quite an accomplishment for them to be third in this uh, tournament. And there were teams from... Uh, 
Tuttle, Oklahoma. Yeah, they came in second. And Poway, and I mean, just all over the state. So just powerhouse <coughs> wrestling teams. So Gilroy did very well, and of course hosted it. Um, I had a fall site visit to Gecko on January 23rd. It was rescheduled a couple times. That's why it's not really fall, January 23rd, but it was a great visit. Uh, Sonia Flores and I walked through all the classrooms and had plenty of time to uh, observe and talk about what's happening at Gecko, and things are going very well, as always. And this week, I don't want to do this again, we had three APS visits. <laughs> so um, we were at Mount Madonna, Christopher High and Luigi. Normally we do two APS visits in a week, but this, this time we, were, we had to do it. And um, what was great is um, I, I'm really impressed with what's happening at the secondary level with their modifications to the APS instrument. So each of the schools have modified our instrument to um, uh, better fit, fit their needs, and we use their instruments as we did the APS visit, which I thought was really good. All the principals were asked to target uh, some standards and some areas of focus, and I thought that was probably the best part of our visits was to hear the principals articulate what, what they're focusing on with their staff and what they wanted us to look for as we walked around the building. So, and of course, at the end, we always debrief, so we just spent three days doing that. I always have a lot of meetings, but we're behind, so I'll just mention one, our Run for Fitness Committee meeting was on January 22nd at Gilroy High. That's where the event will be held on March 10th. I hope you're planning to come to the Run for Fitness. And I, uh, is Dan still here? I think he left. I wanted to call out Dan, uh, our amazing maintenance and operations director, but uh, because we're building a two-story, 20-classroom building at Gilroy High, it cuts into the area that we normally set up for run, run for Fitness, in fact, significantly so. So that's why we went over to the Gilroy High to figure it out how we were going to make it work. There's like 10 of us out there for 45 minutes trying to figure it out. And finally, someone said, well, what if we cut a couple of holes in the fences just to make this whole thing work? And I'm like, oh, no, 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 we can't, we can't do that. We're not going to cut holes in the fences. And they kept pushing me, so I called Dan. Dan came over. And in a matter of 10 minutes, Dan had figured out how to make it work. And that, that's one of the things I just love about him. He's the best maintenance and operations director I've ever worked with. Hopefully you can hear this on tape later. But that's just another example of why he stands out. He's such a can-do, will make it work for kids attitude that I, I just wanted to call that out. And I know you appreciate him as much as I do. We have some upcoming events tomorrow. We have our facilities com a subcommittee meeting all morning. And then Saturday night, uh, all, uh, most of us are going to the Spice of Life Awards, the chamber event, uh, during which one of our own, Maria Walker, will be honored as the Educator of the Year. And a GECA student, an amazing GECA student, Michael Kong, will receive the Susan Valenta Youth Leadership Award. So a bunch of us will be there, Sonia included, and uh, most of us. So we're looking forward to those recognitions. And that concludes my report. Thank you. Um, item five, consent agenda. Move, I need a motion. Move approval. Thank you. Second. Been mo moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, consent agenda accepted. 6A, presentation of the Sobrato Early Academic Language Program. Seal. And we have one of our former principals. It's Here. good to see you. Karina Sapien. <laughs> good morning, or good morning. <laughs> I did that. This is the second time I've done that today. <laughs> Just feels like you've been here that long. Yeah. It's okay. Good evening, everybody. Um, thank you very much for allowing us to speak this evening. I think it was three years ago that I was actually here um, with another colleague of mine when um, SEAL was first beginning to be implemented here in Gilroy. So it's a pleasure to be here this evening to provide an update for you. Um, this update is a product, actually, of another level of support that we as an organization um, provide for all of our districts where we bring our 
principals together from all over the state, and we bring our district leadership together from all over the state. And Kathleen Bierman comes to those, and all of your principals come to those. Um, and as a product of the most recent one, which we just held before the holidays in December, one of the things that grew out of that was a recommendation from our district leadership there suggesting that we take an active stance and role in really looping our boards in, in the districts where we have a presence. And so that's part of why we're here this evening. And I am um, going to turn it over to these two lovely ladies who will move forward and, and give you an update. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, it is really great to be here in familiar territory and see so many friendly and familiar faces. So uh, thank you for having us today. Um, I want to uh, start um, just with a little bit of context. I know that this isn't information that you don't already know, but I kind of want to set the context for our, where, our te where uh, California teachers are and where, where SEAL it fits into that. Um, So, okay. so um, for, uh, to begin with, they have to implement the California standards and the framework. And there's something new that's called the California English Learner Roadmap. You should have gotten it in your packet. I sent that to you, and you may have already seen it before that, but if you didn't have a chance to, to read it, it's, um, it's really important information for our school boards to know. And then there's the NASM study, which is the National Academy of Sciences study about um, English learners and about how, how students learn and about uh, the importance of home language and uh, dual, dual language as well. Teachers also have the next generation si uh, science standards that they need to address. Um, you can skip that one. And um, on top of all of those documents, then there's now shifts in policy. Um, we have the seal of biliteracy, which Gilroy has now in 26 states, and the passage of Proposition 58, which 74% um, of the counties in California voted for to um, end the anti-bilingual education. Um, that we had before and calling for an expansion of bilingual education. And then um, the, the roadmap, which supersedes Prop 227 um, and calls for the integration of language and literacy with content, also con culturally responsive education. And so I'm always amazed when I stop and think about what, what our teachers have to do. Um, and so I take, this is the, the Common Core State Standards. This is the California Language Arts Standards. And then this is the framework. Those are only three of the documents because there's also the Next Generation Science Standards, which I didn't bring all these because I couldn't carry them all, but um, we have the roadmap, we have the, the, the NASM study, which is research about effective teaching strategies, and then we have the social studies standards and the art standards. And so our teachers are called upon to implement every single one of these documents by the state of California. And if you stop and think about it, this is an incredibly daunting task. I mean, how on earth can our teachers do this? Even just the thought of just reading them is, is a daunting task. And right in the middle of that sits SEAL. And as a matter of fact, Gilroy teachers are doing this. Gilroy SEAL teachers are doing this. They are implementing all of these documents. And um, that is, that is what, what is at the heart of SEAL, is, is enacting the frameworks, the standards that the state of California um, has us enact, and for English learners. English learners at the heart of this. We are in over 100 sites now, started out in Silicon Valley, 100 sites, 20 districts. You can see that um, we're far north in, in Williams and all the way down south into um, LA Unified School District. And then the, the concentration is mainly in, in Silicon Valley. Okay. <laughs> so there are three foundations that SEAL strives to enact. One of them is to prevent long-term English learners. And we all know that uh, through our observations, research, data that we've seen year after year after year, our ELs were left behind and no child left behind. And many of our students seem proficient. They speak um, with, with 
um, somewhat proficiently and it kind of fools us because they actually weren't proficient and weren't achieving at the same levels of, as our EO students. And so we have, you know, par part of our foundation is to prevent that long-term e English learner syndrome. And then also to implement the most recent English learner research, um, part of which comes from that NASM study, that our ELs um, need their home language, that developing their home language actually helps them to develop English, that um, the families can be involved in that process, and um, that that language, oral language development, is at the heart of building that language. And then, also, we need to address the rigor of the 21st century um, education and the Common Core and the new generation standards. And at the heart of all that is SEAL, and that intersection is where we sit. So what is SEAL? What makes SEAL unique is a, it's a con comprehensive change strategy. And we hit all four of these areas, student achievement and experience, that um, experience of joy, a, a safe learning environment with high academic standards, with high rigor, and teacher professional development, which is really um, very unique. Uh, it's very deep, it's, it's very extensive. There's teacher collaboration across schools, across um, even across school districts. Um, family engagement and partnership is part of the SEAL model, as well as system articulation, leadership consistency. And Patty mentioned a minute ago that there's also support for district level, site level administrators. And so it's really a comprehensive strategy that, that hits um, every aspect of a child's education. So what is SEAL? It's instructional change. It's curriculum redesign. We are called upon by the state of California to enact the framework and to address the standards. And so that, that um, is, is what we do. Um, it's an approach to professional development that ends emphasizes in building skills, culture, and structures of professional co collaboration, in addition to deep implementation of the model in the classroom. It's about system alignment and coherence. Um, what I was saying, we have teachers that plan across schools, that plan across, and coaches that get together across school district, administrators that do as well. And so what you see in SEAL classrooms is very consistent across SEAL classrooms, all across the state of California. It's also leadership development, um, technical assistance, and support for administrators, as we said before. So um, in case you're not familiar with the model, it's, it's two to three years. Typically, it's a three-year model, and we do um, two-year cycles for teachers. So the first grade levels, K-1, typically, will do two years. And then in the second year, the next grade level comes on board, which is two, three. So you have that kind of bubble. Um, and there's a, a mix of delivery. We have modules, or six modules per year, uh, per cycle, for two year cycle. Um, each one two days. There are lem lesson demonstrations that our trainers come and provide with Gilroy students, as well as the coaches do, your, your own coaches do as well. There's coaching and facilitation, collaboration, there's planning days, and then there's the Summer Institute, which sort of pulls it all together. Um, and SEAL incorporates the latest research, reading research, um, and the standards are always an integral part of everything that, that is planned. Um, and it's about trying strategies and, and refining strategies and um, designing and honing curriculum. And we work with grade level spans in alignment. So part of that support, it starts in preschool. We have preschool modules and convenings. That, um, we have parent, also a parent engagement module where we bring um, our principals and our, our parent liaisons together to do some planning. Um, we also have a bilingual dual language program module. We have coach convenings, principal convenings, district leadership convenings, and then instructional rounds where our principals, and this year some of our coaches walked with their principals in terms of looking at, at the program and in what ways that they can work together to help improve um, implementation. So we have a few, um, a little bit of research. Um, the study is, th th this is a fairly new um, 
undertaking. And so um, we have some CELT data. There was a pilot that was done. And the pilot over time, you can see that students um, made significant progress. 79% of the students in cohort one moved up one or more levels. Um, and all of the cohorts um, met their account or surpassed their accountability targets. And you can see if you look at cohorts one, two, and three that each year they got a little bit stronger. So that was the SEAL pilot that um, was a few years back. And then the latest one, after um, year, year one of replication of our sites who have replicated SEAL, this, the data is similar. You can see that same trend um, going up and um, with strong growth in, in English proficiency on CELT across all the SEAL schools. Um, and then um, another thing that we measure is teacher efficacy and the sense of impact uh, and satisfaction was very high for teachers. So we now have a partnership with Loyola Marymount University that we are um, looking at. Um, this is the purpose of the study to examine classroom level practices and answer three questions. In what way do teachers' levels of implementation of SEAL high leverage practices change as a result of their participation in SEAL? What are teachers' perceptions of their knowledge, skills, and abilities in teaching culturally and linguistically diverse students? And what differences are found in the implementation of SEAL practices across schools or districts? And that's through the depth of implementation tool, which is also something new for us. Um, and so that second bullet, um, talk, that's okay. Talked about, no, this, this, yeah. Talked about the increased levels of teacher knowledge and skills in teaching culturally and linguistically diverse students after completing the SEAL modules. So before, on the teacher surveys, and this is through that Loyola study, more than half of the respondents rated themselves as non or novice users of EL research-based strategies when they started SEAL. After completing the two years, 99% of the teachers reported an intermediate or advanced level of SEAL strategies after program participation. Okay, I'm gonna turn it over to Venus. She's going to talk about some of the Gilroy data. I um, was looking for a stool and I couldn't find one, so bear with me as I move the mic and swing it this way because I feel like I'm stuck and, and um, a little height in, impaired. So um, if we look at the slide, in 2015-16, we started with two schools in Gilroy um, Glenview and Elliott, and it was our kinder and first grade teams that did that. And then if you go on to the next year, you see the blue, we've bumped them down, and now they're implementing or learning about modules four, five, and six in Glenview and Elliott. And your grades two and three are now training for modules one, two, and three. In addition to that, we've picked up another cohort, so El Roble, ADB, and Rucker, um, and they're in modules one, two, and three. This year, your first class, so to speak, in the blue, they're in refinement. So they're continuing those unit development days, they're continuing to refine their units. Um, and then your second and third grade teachers are finishing up with modules four, five, and six. And then you've picked up another class, that two, three class, and they're in modules one, two, and three. And I'm I say this, I want you to keep in mind, 16 and 17, last year, we only had Glenview and Elliott and only that very first class had finished the training. And the reason why I'm pointing this out is because in a couple of slides, I'll be showing some data that's reflective of the 16-17 school year. So let's bear in mind which cohort, which participating teachers those were. Okay, so again, our five schools, and this was at the end of last year. And this measured the impact on students. So our eyes are always automatically drawn to where are the highest scores and where are we gonna grow? So I've circled. In green are our highest scores, 4.1 in our first cohort, and a four. And to what degree have you seen more joyful and confident engagement in content? And we all want joy. So we're <laughs> happy and thrilled that our students are joyful in their learning. And what are our next steps? It's that 2.9. Cohort two. So that means those last three was it three schools that we picked up? ADB and um, Rucker and um, El Roble, right. thank you. So we just started those and they're only in cohorts one, two, and three. Uh, sorry, modules one, two, and three. And this part is in improved writing. We do, teach impr we do teach writing strategies. We do have those modules. 
but it's very heavy in modules four, five, and six. So they'll, they'll be looking forward to that this year. I just wanted to point that part out. Okay. Overall in Gilroy, 63% of the teachers reported seeing very positive changes in student participation. 69% to a very high degree of change in rigor, complexity, and production of oral language and academic language. 44% significant degree of improved writing, including more descriptive drawing for the younger children. And 78%, I love that number, very significant degree of more joyful and confident engagement in content and learning among their students. 47% um, for strengthened family engagement. And again, it was only that first cohort that had finished modules four, five, and six and then um, our next set of teachers are coming through. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, you had 32 teacher responses. Is that, is that the total amount of teachers in five schools that are participating in SEAL? In this particular survey. So 32. Mm, right, so no from number, the total number. There's probably not 100%, um, but it's a pretty, it's pretty it's close. It's pretty close. It's pretty close. So it's almost everybody. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay, this is um, a table showing the impacts on the teachers teaching. And again, our eyes are always drawn to the highest and lowest numbers. So down at the bottom, we have a 4.26 and a 4.4. To what degree has SEAL thematic planning resulted in more access for students? And that's what we're about, is access for students to a full curriculum. And then we have a 3.4. To what degrees have these changes felt positive to you, and that was from cohort one. And change is hard, mm -hmm. and we all go through growing pains, so. Um, and then cohort two, they probably are expecting that change, and that's a 3.7, so it went up a little bit higher. Feedback on the process, so this is for us on SEAL implementation. Um, you can see that the summer bridge quality all the way down at the bottom of that first column and up at the top, the summer bridge quality is a 4.4, and the summer bridge usefulness, 4.58. And we always tell teachers, yes, at the end of school, you've earned vacation, and we want you to do 10 days of PD, <laughs> but they always come out at the other end more joyful, more enlightened. It's all come put together, and it's reflected here, too. So 4.44 and 4.58, and where do, need, where do we need to go? Um, maybe collaborate collaborative planning quality, and unit development quality. And collaborative planning is also hard because not only are you working with teachers across your own grade level, but now I'm being introduced to teachers at another site or maybe two other sites, and so there's a lot of negotiations and things that I need to give up or that they need to give up and personalities that we need to work with. So collaborative planning is, is hard, but we also don't want to, our, our teachers to work in silos. Right? We want them to use each other's strengths and build on them and um, to work better, not harder, or smarter. Work smarter, not harder. So I'd like to read some voices of Gilroy teachers and your SEAL coach facilitators. This year has been a great learning experience, lots of fun challenges, and sometimes painful growth. SEAL helps me to become a better teacher and a better person. I feel I am stronger and more confident teacher Mostly my students have benefited from the use of these strategies. I enjoy teaching chants. Mm -hmm. SEAL has made my class fun. My students love learning through chants, drawn labels, projects, and the researcher center. I enjoyed all the creativity that SEAL encourages. My students expanded their academic language over the year. They were excited to learn, and the units we created were engaging. The first year was very overwhelming. I felt like I was in a big fog because my brain was so full of info and I wasn't very confident. The second year, I felt more comfortable and confident because we had plenty of time to practice many of the strategies. Now, at the end of Summer Bridge, after my second year, the pieces are falling into place. I feel confident about starting next year. Finishing year two was exciting and honestly a sigh of relief. It's hard to have so many sub days, two years in a row, even though it is so worth it. 
I feel so <laughs> confident about doing what I teach and how I teach it. Going forward will just give me time to perfect my skills, add more joy and depth to the units, and explore using SEAL strategies in all aspects of the day. What a wonderful program. Hands down, the most quality professional training I have ever had. It feels so good to be valued as a professional teacher. So where do we go from here? Year three and beyond, while your first class, so to speak, may be done with those modules and those trainings, they're still negotiating those units. Now they've had all modules one through six, they're revisiting units one, two, and three that they started a couple years ago and they're thinking to themselves, oh, what was, I th what was my purpose in this particular unit? Was that essential question really what I wanted to ask? And so they're redefining it, they're refining it, they're again, um, uh, tightening the rigor, I would say, or increasing the rigor. So, um, increase the unif unit development days. We need the coaching to sustain effective and deep implementation. And then again, we've said before, there's SEAL support for the coaches, the principals, um, the district leadership convenings, and the instructional rounds, which we just had. Where we're going, am I doing this? So <clears throat> where we're going from here, um, we continue to expand uh, to other districts in the state of California. However, we are being extremely strategic about where we're doing that. We are targeting areas of high EL need, which is why you see that we're in the Valley, we're in LA Unified, we're in places like Williams. That will continue for us as an organization. Um, we, if. You, if you're not aware of this, we are piloting um, four or five right now. What has happened is that as the students go through with their teachers all the way through third grade, we have teachers that are coming to us in fourth and fifth grade who are saying they don't know what to do with these kids because these kids have been taught in a certain way now and they receive them and the teachers don't know how to teach them because even the, the kids in some cases are saying, excuse me, that's not what, how this, <laughs> this is not how this goes. <laughs> this is, uh, you know, the, particularly with all the engagement with all the materials in the room, um, it feels very different. A SEAL classroom is very different um, than a traditional classroom that you might be used to from years ago. So four or five was something that was actually demanded of us by districts their parents, students themselves, and we are piloting that right now in Oak Grove in here in San Jose, and we're piloting it in Fillmore, which is down in the Central Coast. So that pilot is um, for modules one, two, and three. We're halfway through it, and we are beginning to talk to districts who in, are in certain places with implementation. We wanna work with districts who have their teachers through a certain amount before we actually introduce four or five. Um, we also are developing a standalone separate preschool um, set of modules. We, although they're included in preschool, our model goes pre-K to three, we find that we have consortiums of preschools in different parts of the state that operate collaboratively that, in that way. So we're offering, when that happens, like in Long Beach right now, we're in Long Beach and we're offering them standalone preschool modules. And those kids feed into preschools all over the place. So that's a new thing for us. Um, we also have a grant that we received from the state that's a bilingual recruitment and professional development grant. We got that this year. That work begins for us in the spring. We're already in a planning process and 11 out of all of our districts here in the state are participating in that. Um, I think in closing that these, what you see here, really embody what we're about. Um, it is truly a unique experience to both work for the organization but also to be a SEAL teacher and watch um, teachers go through the growth that they experience when they go through the professional development. It really changes the way that people approach their whole professional experience. And we've seen it happen over the past five years actively here, in it, right here in this region. 
So, and your teachers are in the thick of it and in the middle of it and doing great work as well as your coaches here in Gilroy and your principals. So thank you very much for your attention this evening. I know if you have any questions, I don't know if you, I don't know how, if we have time, but we're open to questions if you have them. We have some questions. Trustee Good. Yes, is, is at any part in this evaluation process is the impact on student achievement evaluated? Because I, I hear a lot of come back from the teachers and they like it and it's great, but what's actually happening to the students? Yeah, so we have right now, we're in the process of um, engaging with Loyola Marymount University. They are our external evaluator. And the, the way that, that that evaluation is working is it started in 2013. So there's what we refer to as treatment. So, and you can imagine how difficult it is to actually follow students longi longitudinally, because that's the best way to actually get data that's worthwhile. So we have to find, we, we're actually tracking the students, and this is happening here in Gilroy. We are, have people are coming in and assessing your students here. So they are going to be a part of this data that comes out. Um, the thing that is difficult about it is that what the treatment is, is we consider it to be at the end of that three years. So the factors of teachers coming and going or moving away or students that leave, you lose that student and their data. So that's why it's spread over this chunk of time. And we should see, we should start to see some of that data come out in uh, the fall of next year that are following this chunk of students. So that's to come. Um, the data that we shared with you earlier was data that came from the pilot that is part of what was a decision point that you looked at when you made the decision to actually implement SEAL. We're finding our preliminary findings to reflect very closely to what it showed in the CELT score gains in the pilot. It doesn't apply to your CASP scores because, you know, your students don't get tested until they're in third grade. So there isn't, we don't have, that's not a measurement for us. So that's a, a long way to answer a question that we're in process with a very esteemed partner in LMU and we should have something to share with you sometime in the fall. Great, thank yeah. you. Any other questions? Trustee Pace. Um, reading through your material, there was a, a lot about uh, English learners um, a lot of our students, however, do speak English. Can you can you speak to how effective the program is to uh, native English speakers as well? Right, I can. Um, so, at the heart of SEAL, the as um, you saw earlier, it grew out of the research of Dr. Lori Olson, who whose background is with prevention of long-term English language learners. So, at the heart is the EL student, but the strategies that teachers are taught and what they walk away with are strategies for all students. This, it's good teaching for everyone, and everyone in that class together gets that. I have a question, and the uh, LMU, will they be looking at EO progress as well as EL progress? It'll be all, it'll be all, all the students? students within that class that are tracked, yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you very much. You Thanks to our principals and coaches yeah. and teachers who came this evening. We appreciate it. Yeah, so thank you. Thank so you. do we. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs>
Okay. So our LCAP goals, we do have the five goals. These actually encompass um, eight of the state priorities um, that are required for school districts to address. And our goals really focus on um, three of them are the classroom academics and then two of them deal with our teachers and our facilities. So goal one is to provide high quality instruction in 21st century learning opportunities to ensure college and career readiness and 21st century skills for all students. That's how we incorporate eight goals into five. We make them very long um, with a lot of aspects to them. So really the first part is to develop and support effective instruction. So how are we doing that? We're focusing a lot on our professional development. Um, this year our elementary and our middle schools are focusing on the English language arts adoption. Um, secondary, we do have a workshop model for our strands. Um, for our three PD days, we offer over 16 different strands and opportunities for learning for our teachers. We also have academic coaches at the elementary and instructional specialists at the secondary level that support our teachers across the different um, curricular areas. Um, as you heard Dr. Flores mention the walkthrough tools, our principals and our teachers are using um, walkthrough tools to help them really review the practices on their site and help them develop plans. And we also work hard, and you've heard some about our academic and coaches and instructional specialists. There are two different models. That's why the two different names. So we have academic coaches at our elementary. We have been hindered a little bit this year in our um, efforts with academic coaches because we do have positions open. So we have um, offered a slight change in that so that instead of full-time coaches, we have offered and we have in fact hired some elementary teachers as part-time coaches in order to fill those positions. It is very hard to do the type of work that we need to in the district with one academic coach for all of our elementary schools. So we will be focusing on the remainder of this year and going into our 18-19 LCAP plan on filling all of the positions um, so that we can get the type of quality um, academic coaching that we need for all schools. Uh, we also have at the secondary, it's a slightly different model where we have the equivalent of a 1.0 FTE at our um, middle and high schools. And what they do is they split those up right now between several different people so that we can um, focus more on the different content areas and supporting ELD, EL students and our ELD program across all content areas. We also, in the middle, you see our PBIS coach who supports all schools in the district. So this is a slide that you saw at our last presentation on how um, we are doing for professional development. So really we're looking at our SEAL coaches as well as our academic coaches and instructional specialists on how they are doing in supporting the teachers. And although we are not fully staffed, we still have a lot of our teachers who um, are saying that they have made a positive impact on student learning and that they are receiving support from their SEAL coach, academic coach, or their instructional specialist. And in terms of the knowledge that they have received during the staff development days, uh, we have a lot who are saying some, which is kind of typical in this model because remember we have three days out of the school year. So this is not an ongoing program where they're receiving, like SEAL, where they receive ongoing training throughout the school year, these are three particular days. So to get some is honestly great that they are taking that information and they are implementing it back in their classroom. To have, you know, at 20, 21, 27, and 29 percent saying they're fully implementing everything they, they learn is amazing to me um, because it's a challenge to do that when you have three days that are spread out over the course of a full year. And then of course, not incorporated, we're always trying to get that number to zero and working to change our model the best we can so that that does get down to zero. I thought it was interesting in all three of our APS visits that teachers were implementing strategies they received last Friday at the PD day. Mm -hmm. cool. That yes. was cool. <coughs> yeah.
And another area is the Common Core State Standard materials, as you've seen a lot as we keep bringing adoptions to you. And that will be continuing because we have more to go with science and social studies. So we, we have fully adopted for elementary and middle school for our English. You will be seeing soon a recommendation for our high school English. We're also ongoing support for math. We are in our second year of adoption for our elementary and middle. We are in our third year of adoption for high school for math. Um, for high school science, we have, um, we are, implementing our biology, our chemistry, we're starting to look at our physics, so we are starting to do more with new materials. We're actually going to start the process of piloting um, materials for the middle school for next year. Um, we have been waiting patiently for the state, and we're getting impatient, so we're looking at some other methods and working with the state um, materials. Uh, we're also looking at updating materials for our special education classes and getting them access to the core materials. So science standards. We have, <laughs> this year we have um, fully implemented our um, district science team. So we do have an NGSS team that um, spans K through 12 where they are working together on a plan on how to implement across the board um, for all of the new science standards. Our high school is a little bit ahead. They started a couple years ago, so they have been working on, on the new science standards and especially the new practices um, and cross-cutting concepts, those things. So they are actually now kind of leading that team and working with our middle schools and our elementary on how we can incorporate NGSS district-wide and a, a process to do so. Oh, yes, we are having, uh, on that end, we are having a summer symposium um, for K-12 teachers. We are working with Morgan Hill Unified on that um, to have, it's, it will be a workshop model um, where teachers will have the opportunity to go to a variety of workshops on a one-day symposium to learn about NGSS. College and career, as you know, we did get the CTE grant. We are going to be actively working to renew that grant as well. And we've been working on our course inventories and updating our course courses to meet the new state requirements of having clear articulated pathways for our CTE courses. So what that means is that we have to show that we are not just saying, oh, they're in this course, so they are a CTE student. No, it has to be a clear pathway where by the end of that program, they are marketable. So they can go out to the workforce or they can continue on um, into a trade school, a junior college, or a college to be able to receive certification into their career of choice. So we have been working on that. We have also um, restarted our CTE advisory. They will be meeting actually this month. This is mine too. And then our 21st century skills. We're actually very proud of the work that we've been doing around technology. Like NGSS, we also now have a district-wide technology committee that's been working on a lot of different aspects. And so it's helped greatly that all of our curriculum now, so for our benchmark, our GoMath, CPM, our StudySync, all of them have a lot of technology integrated right into them. So that's helped create kind of an impetus to use technology more in the classroom. And with that, they've said, okay, how can we not just use this to substitute for paper and pencil in those books, how can we actually go beyond and help our kids learn new skills? So our teachers have asked for more training on the four C's, for example, and the use of technology in meeting the four C's. They've also asked for more information on how to really create a learning tool using all the different devices we have. One of the big ones, obviously, is, is phones. Um, cell phones for kids. Most of our kids, honestly, from grades three up, 
have access to cell phones. So how do we use those as a learning tool in the classroom um, since they have them with them on a regular basis instead of being kind of a problem. So we're not there yet <laughs> where we're going to be and we're not advocating that they're going to be using them all the time. But what, how do we teach kids to use the, um, the technology that they have access to responsibly in the classroom? Um, if you get um, the Gilroy Morgan Hill magazine, we have a wonderful article in there um, this month, not only about our assistant superintendent, um, Paul Winslow, but also about technology in Gilroy Unified and all the different things that we're doing. So we're working very hard as a district to really look at the different levels, looking at K-5 and what we can do to support technology, looking at 6-8. Um, the 6-8 math teachers just had a coding workshop. Um, they're very excited about. They've asked for more training and how we can really look at some of our new computer science standards and get them into the middle school. And then um, with high school, who again is a little bit ahead of that, mainly because of the access and that our kids often know more <coughs> than we do at that level about technology. And then again, how do we make it meaningful? So we're working very hard in that area and are very excited about the future for technology here in Gilroy. So I'm going to talk about goal two. Our LCAP goal two is to provide equitable support for all learners. You just heard a wonderful presentation about our SEAL, which um, goes right in line with our goal 2.1, establish a strong language and literacy foundation. We know that first line of instruction is critical for preventing future problems in, in terms of students needing intervention. To that end, we have been really putting a lot of our time, resources, and energy into supporting teachers at that level. Clearly, SEAL implementation is a very big initiative in our district and one that we, um, we support wholeheartedly and are seeing great gains in terms of our students. But in, across all of the district, we are interested in making sure that our teachers are well equipped to be able to provide that foundation for students. So this year, we provided the Literacy Foundation. It's, uh, we call it the Literacy Academy. It's uh, foundational skills for, for all TK, K, and first grade teachers. It was three days spread over the course of the year. They just finished their last day, uh, last Friday. Uh, very well received by the majority of teachers, even veteran teachers, um, taught by a, a, one of our uh, Santa Clara County Office of Ed consultants, who is a guru about early literacy. Um, but the purpose of that, again, was to uh, underscore the importance of that uh, uh, sp particular skill development with our young students. And what does that look like in a classroom, small group instruction? What happens when students um, are not doing well? And how do they go about diagnosing those skills and attending to those? And we continue to also assess, I'm going to go back just slightly, assess our students um, on a regular basis and take a look at that data. What you see there is our, our point right now uh, that 49% of first graders are on track to reach the end of year proficiency at this point in the school year. Last year was about 47%. Clearly, our goal is to have all students reading, reaching that end of year target, but we take, um, we take this uh, trimester data um, to be able to measure where we are across all the schools, and of course, the principals have that data so they can um, respond to it. Um, this is about supporting our students to complete A through G requirements. Again, we've done a lot of work in this area. Uh, our summer school has expanded over the course of several years. It used to be clearly um, credit recovery for 11th and 12th grade students, and now we have 9th and 10th grade students because we want to uh, catch students and make sure that, that we can get them on track. And one way to measure um, our A through G completion is to look at our Math 3 completion data. Um, so right now we have 86% of students enrolled, in, 11th graders enrolled in Math 3, which is good. We have a right, right at this current time for semester data, we have an 89% pass rate for those students. Um, so again, that tends to correlate that pass rate with CSU UC um, eligibility. So it's an important data point for us. Um, and we have that MAP assessment, which we added because we don't have CASP assessments for um, until 11th grade, so we have 9th and 10th graders um, in, in MAP. We, saw, we show a slight um, increase uh, for, for our MAP scores currently. 
This is also another ongoing goal we've been working at for a number of years, is how do we work collaboratively with teachers um, to look at student progress and then um, and do um, some planning. It creates a more cohesive instructional program when you put teachers together and have them look at data and see students as not just their own students, but and their ownership of a grade level or a department. It's they're all of our students. And so having people be more comfortable with the assessment tools is very important to us. We are seeing increased use of EDEMS, teachers creating EDEMS, which is our, our man data management system, creating assessments in EDEMS that they use across their department. And again, that's a positive thing. Um, our curriculum, our new curriculum offers a lot of assessments that teachers are trying out and again using those in their groups together to talk about that progress. They're quite challenging in our new curriculum, those assessments that uh, the teachers are finding that the rigor is very high, but good discussions and good kind of dissection of that. Um, in addition, we give the CASP interims. One new feature is this uh, reporting system that allows them to drill down a little bit more data analysis in terms of the items. So now teachers can see where students are struggling on those interims. And again, that's sort of a predictor for our CASP results. So doing that along the way is going to help them adjust their teaching. Our English learner focus continues to be very strong. Uh, we're uh, very pleased with the professional development that our secondary teachers have been receiving thanks to our secondary EL coach and the EL instructional specialist. And so there is a series of trainings that started at a very basic level. We spoke to you about it, I believe, in the fall, where it was just the awareness of who are my students and what are their, uh, what are their levels of English to now looking at you know, the standards and what does an ELD lesson look like, integrated as well as designated. What does it look like in a science class? What does it look like across all content areas? and then creating actual assessments themselves. So that's what's gonna be happening right now, or is happening right now in January. Um, so this is, again, via the um, EL coach. Mm -hmm. And this is the model uh, of, with the secondary EL coach where she works with the EL specialist. The EL specialist, in turn, help facilitate on early release days with middle and high school uh, these professional development sessions. And it's a series, so we continue to reinforce and expand. So goal through, Goal three, school culture and engagement, uh, you've heard a lot about, and again, our positive school climate. Uh, we have done a lot of work in this area with helping uh, schools look at kind of the big package beyond just our, our anti-bullying, but what are the other targeted areas of need to support students? and bringing in other resources in the community to work together. That's why you see this idea of a multi-tiered system of support. You see uh, um, agencies like the Youth Task Force coming together, and we're beginning to see kind of like all the aspects of school climate, you know, from the, from the restorative justice to mindfulness to having, creating the, the, a classroom, a safe classroom community um, that accepts uh, differences in students, the kindness challenge you heard earlier, it's across all the district from the little ones all the way up. So a, a, a sort of all encompassing, uh, what does a positive school climate look like for students as well as a safe one? And a shift in our attendance a little bit from uh, truancy focus, which tends to be kind of frankly, uh, well, it's very challenging <laughs> to, to address the, the, the huge truancy issue. Right now, we're looking at really chronic absenteeism, and there's some data right there uh, monthly. Uh, Jennifer produces that for the principals. They review that. But it's, again, about supporting families. Like, what, what are some of those root causes for that absenteeism? And working with the families to see what can we do to support them. Um, Rebecca's Children's Service is, again, one of our partners. And goal four, um, high quality, is actually high quality staff. We've expanded that goal to um, not just teachers. And we have a lot of aspects of that. Um, one of the ones that I wanna point out is that we're really supporting our special ed paraeducators with professional development. That's been a big push this year. Um, and we're pleased that that's gonna continue um, to support them. 
Um, we um, are working again with our first and second year teachers. This is a program we started last year and funded by the Educator Effectiveness uh, funds, that grant does end in June, but um, we have been able to put together a program that establishes site mentors. So there's a go-to person on site for that new teacher, and in addition to our monthly uh, teacher academies. Note that those challenges for new teachers are not surprising. Uh, those are things that all new teachers, we all experience, classroom management uh, being one of the big areas of need. And to that end, again, um, the try to, we try to focus the New Teacher Academy on these key topics. It's really very satisfying to see and inspiring really to see that our teachers themselves are the ones that are delivering to their uh, colleagues uh, these professional development sessions. So it's teachers teaching teachers and they're kind of showing them uh, this is how we, how we have attacked these problems and helping them with some of those uh, issues or a parent, how to work with parents, um, discipline, and then many other the areas that you see there. And then, Superintendent Nessa. Thank you. Good evening, board. Good evening, Superintendent. The next couple of slides will have a common theme focused on health and safety. And I also want to take the opportunity to thank Dan McAuliffe because this is proactive approach in nature that brings the concerns to the subcommittee and eventually to you as a board. And thank you as well for approving all these expenditures so that we can continue to make our facilities, um, to maintain our facilities. So uh, the roof replacement, repairs, um, sewage ejection pump, I don't know exactly what that is, but it was critical that we um, make that repair. It sounds important for health and safety. So we got it done. Trips and hazards. So all these absolutely have a health and safety theme and either limit our exposure and liability or completely eliminate it. So I also, of course, want to thank Dan McAuliffe and our entire staff for bringing it to our attention. Um, and the next slide um, just has some more additional ongoing issues like playground equipment, um, things of that nature, inspections, the wood fill at multiple sites, uh, replacing outdoor benches and tables that you think, well, that's not a health and safety hazard. But in some cases, it can be because little kids get cut and nicked and, and uh, just having lunch. And that was done at Rucker recently, and the staff really appreciate that, and the kids do as well. Um, the gas systems, I think, are absolutely critical. And that, again, is some immediate repairs that need to take place. And some of those we bring to you, unfortunately, as ratifications, but I think you would understand the nature of that immediate concern. And uh, the last one is uh, emergency elevator rollering system at CHS. That that's also another safety issue. Um, all these add up to well over a million one, I believe. And the state only um, funds deferred maintenance to the tune of 332,000. That's it. So everything apart from that um, is funded either through routine restricted <coughs> maintenance um, and through our own set aside of $380,000 for the deferred maintenance. So I also like to, to thank the board for having that al additional allocation, as you can see, is very needed and, and uh, well executed. So this is the cycle that we're engaged in, and right now we're right here at the mid-year review, just giving you an update. Um, at our next curriculum and instruction meeting with principals, we'll be conducting mid-year review with them. Uh, we look at evidence of progress and they, their own at their schools, as well as a district-wide lens, and then they are conducting their beginning their stakeholder meetings. That's with their ELAC or their school site council uh, to gather input. If you recall, we did the survey earlier this year, so the survey was actually conducted. We gave you those survey results in December, but now we're doing the part where they're engaging with parents and community members. Uh, we'll do this here at the district level with DLAC, with all of our parent groups, where we talk to them about the goals and get further input and refinement. So that's all stakeholders at this point. And again, collecting our data for our annual update, which is part of the LCAP review and going through that entire process. So if you have questions at this time, we'd be happy to take them. Yep. Trustee Good. Uh, going back to 3.2, mm -hmm. there was a bullet point that mentioned chronic absenteeism rate is tracked monthly. So it's current rate 10.7%. 10.7% of what? Of overall. 
attendance. Is it 11,500 students? Yes. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Ballpark. Ten, Ten days or more. Ten percent yeah. so, so of the that's year. That's of our entire student population? Yes. Yes. And, and that, you know, one challenge that we have is, frankly, with our TK and kinder students, um, there's a lot of absenteeism with those very young students. So sometimes the schools that have TKs, for example, are saying, well, wait, my data is very skewed. But even for kindergarten, it's, it's, it's very high. You know, Absenteeism rate is in our lowest grades. A lot of our parents don't view kindergarten as it's not required, and t nor is TK. So we have lots of kids that have been out 10, 15, 20 days. And part of looking at the chronic absenteeism is because truancy focuses on unexcused absences, basically, where chronic tru uh, chronic absenteeism focuses on students who have been out of school for 10 or more days, whether excused or unexcused. So it's really focusing on, we do have parents who are calling their children in, sometimes for health reasons, that we need to have a discussion with the family about the options, because there is a health issue with the child and they can't get to school. But the longer they're out of school, the further behind they're going to get. So that is one of the reasons of the change of focus, so we can be more proactive and try to get the kids in, this, in the environment that they need to be successful in school. And so then other than the grant from Rebecca's, what, what are we doing? Is it for chronic truance, uh, absenteeism? Yeah. Oh, we should have had Jennifer For here. here. She's right. totally okay. her area of responsibility, but we could definitely she give you a report. She did. She did give yeah. a yes. report in the fall, but we could have her give you an update about it. But she does meet with families, and, you know, yes. one of the things that the principals, that's the support to principals, is she meets with the families. They bring in, you know, again, it's, it's sitting down with families and saying, what can we do to support you? And sometimes, you know, sometimes families don't want to come to the meeting, so she's doing that outreach. Sometimes she goes to them. So yeah. she is, you know, when she gives that data to each of the principals, she is the connection, the liaison to, to do that outreach. And we usually start, just because I've gone to some of them myself, myself, at the elementary level, we'll ask the parents of those chronically absent students to come to a group meeting, and we'll have all the agencies there that can provide mm -hmm. the support, and the DA, by the way, often comes, and AJ, our person who goes out on some of these home visits. Mm -hmm. So it often starts with that group meeting with the parents, and those have been pretty effective. I mean, this is not an easy, uh, target area actually it's a very difficult target area but we're making some good progress so, so the DA hasn't checked out of this that's a complicated answer <laughs> but again, my understanding was they were the DA's office wasn't They're doing not anything prosecuting anymore no. at all <laughs> that's, right. that, that's a major change and it's not really the DA it was more the judge who handles this mm -hmm. we met we had a meeting with her and the DA's office some of us were at that meeting it's a change of focus on their part. They found in their research that the punitive approach was having no, no it wasn't making a difference. Mm -hmm. So they wanted a more um, a intervention, which we've been, that's been our focus, um, intervention and prevention approach versus, um, you know, the punitive approach. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Trustee McCart. You know, Mark, <clears throat> I had put some comments on that same page. And then I want to check with Alvaro if I'm figuring this out right. So let's say we have 11,500 students, ballpark. Mm -hmm. So 10.7% of that number have chronic absenteeism, correct? And Kermit, correct. Kermit compiles this data, so. Okay, so Kermit that's that's about 1,230 students. Right. Mm -hmm. so and then. This, so at this point of the year, if you figure there's been 80, 80 and 90 school days. So that 100 number, yesterday, that by the way, students, I found out. Okay. That number of students have been absent nine days. Yeah. Many of those could be illness, right? And so, sure. you know, you'll have many students who maybe have been ill for a week and a half, especially if uh, something goes around. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. you know, we haven't, we don't break it down that way. We, we're just looking at the number of students who have missed eight days oh, no. after 80 days of school, you know, approximately first semester, per first, first se. So, what, is, Alvaro, tell us again, what is ADA? What do we, 
accrue as far as ADA goes per so, student? So this year, roughly about $9,043 per student is your average daily what attendance for the day? whole year? What is for it? the whole year? Yeah. Um, so you divide that by probably 139 or so, okay. um, 60, 62, 64, something like that uh, per day. Uh, so that's obviously a really great point is it matters to us, not only instructionally, but financially, of course. Well, it has to matter to us as a board financially. But the other point about kindergarten and pre-K to me is uh, it's not just that they're getting behind. It's that habit of mind mm -hmm. exactly. that, that you want to train a young child that mm -hmm. if it's Wednesday, mm -hmm. oh, I go to school on Wednesday. Right. Mm -hmm. Not I take yeah. We've been working really hard on that. But you know, we yeah, it's always we're been. making some progress, but it's always been. An I wish issue. the state would just mandate both mm -hmm. kindergarten and TK. Yeah. But we do know that there are some generational issues there, and mm -hmm. working with families to yes, change some of those habits. So if students are in the habit um, from a very young age of going yep. to school every day, they will continue. Yep. You know, where if they're in the habit of missing one or two days from a very young age, that pattern tends to continue. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to make any excuses, but it did go down, mm -hmm. and this is the worst year we've had for illnesses. Yes. We, uh, we just have so much illness this year. Every site I go to, that's one of the first things the principal talks about is the number of kids that have the flu or, you know, bad colds. So we've had a lot of illness this year. And, and then, in fact, they do have a lot of holes in their education. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just a lot Definitely. of holes that add up and add up, and all of a sudden, yep. they're in ninth grade. And, <laughs> mm -hmm. it's all, and this isn't just about the lower, I mean, we don't have the chart, but there's no. chronic absenteeism at all levels. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yes. Yeah, but I think it would be good for us to see at some point if we could. Yeah, we can give you a report. That would be and for us, uh, obviously, instructionally, the whole year matters, but financially, from f first uh, instructional day through 136, 39, or 38 yeah. day of school is P2 cutoff. Financially, that's what we care about is those precious 139 days, first yeah. days of school that drive that enrollment. After that, say in May, after P2, mm -hmm. we're not exposed to a financial uh, decrease because P2 is locked in at that point and you know, right. it doesn't really play a role mm -hmm. at that point. But obviously, for instructional purposes, it does. Thank you. I had a couple of more questions. May I ask them? Sure. Nobody okay. else is. Uh, so, uh, could you talk a little bit more about this NGSS team mm -hmm. and that there's going to be a summer symposium? I mean, that's uh, what grade levels is that? Sure. So, we have our NGSS team, we just started this year, and it's really about breaking down NGSS standards, as Karina showed you, the binder is huge yeah. of the standards that they have to meet. And a lot of it, especially for our multiple subject teachers, um, science is not necessarily their area of, of expertise going through school, so trying to give them the support that they need to try to meet all of these standards. So we got our instructional specialists and academic coaches together last spring and said, how can we help move this forward and support all of our teachers in this area? And they said, let's get a committee together and we can look at an NTS team that will help um, establish the professional development as well as the outreach to all of the teachers. So this is a team, there are I think about 18 people on this committee from K-12 um, where they have not only looked at all of the NGSS standards, um, but have determined, okay, where is our focus going to be for the next five years? So they've created a five-year plan. As part of that, they said, how do we kind of jumpstart this? Well, we've been working with Morgan Hill in social studies as well. So Morgan Hill teachers have been coming to us during our professional development days to receive training on the social studies standards. So we said, hey, let's do a trade. Morgan Hill had already started the planning for a um, NGSS symposium for their teachers, so they said, why don't we do a joint training? So that way we can have more trainers, more experts, and more opportunities for our teachers. So some will be very basic, just what is NGSS? What does it mean? 
and then others will go more in depth and go into the different strands. So they will talk about um, the cross-cutting standards, um, which is really um, infusing engineering, um, technology, some of the other things into the standards that they have. Others will focus on really for what we consider performance-based um, instruction, where our students, as part of NGSS, should be the ones creating their own experiments and that gradual release. Um, but basically, they're looking right now at, I think, about 12 different um, strands for teachers to choose from on that day. That's great. And mm -hmm. you answered and my And Kathleen next had one, one more thing to add. I, on I that. was going to ask what, what is this engineering practices at the elementary level? Yeah, so they're they're kind of they are the cross cutting standards. So the expectation is okay. that students are starting from a very young age with that idea of engineering and what that, um, the idea of the maker, right? Mm -hmm. So you'll hear a lot about maker labs. Um, and STEAM, you know, STEAM we've been talking about, STEM we've been talking about, but it really goes down to the idea that our students, in terms of science, are the ones that are doing the exploring. They're the ones coming up with the problems that need to be solved in our society. They're coming up with the experiment that they need to do in order, and the research they need to do in order to solve that problem. And part of that is engineering. So you'll see students um, creating their own robots for different things. I was just in a second grade classroom and they had done an activity where they had to create a robot for a problem they had. And I loved the fact that some of them had one to clean their room. So I said, I want that robot. Um, but they not only had to create that, but then their robot has a problem and it's not working correctly, and they have to then um, figure out how to solve that problem with their robot. So it's really a lot of it is um, how to think like a scientist mm -hmm. in that engineering mode. Any other questions? I just wanted to add that the members of the team, you know, in elementary, we're a little bit behind in this area because they're not science specialists. And so uh, figuring out where to put this into their day is one of their challenges. But the members that are on the team, what they've done is they've actually taken our English language arts curriculum or our math curriculum and figured out some lessons that they try out. They come back and share that with the team. And then one of their responsibilities is they present at the, er, to their staff and share little pieces of the lessons and ideas. Well, that kind of fosters some interest. So we had a couple of schools that did uh, took a whole grade level or a couple of grade levels and decided to do one of these engineering challenges. And it was linked to a story in our English language arts yes. curriculum. And so it was really fun. And the whole grade level did it. And it was perfect. It was right before the holidays. Kids are a little antsy. It was lots of fun for the kids. It had writing components, reading components, and of course, this engineering part. So I think we are taking this in pieces to be able to spread this. Right. Yeah. Great. It's good to hear that there'll be support for teachers because it is a lot to take in, mm -hmm. as Karina yeah. suggested to us. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Thank you very Thank much. You. Okay, item 6C, Board Policy Revisions, first reading. All right, so this is... <laughs> this, uh, this is our first uh, trial run of not having a committee and the board as a whole, are, are you're receiving these board policy revisions. These are from October and uh, in the next month we'll, we'll be bringing you December's, yeah. December's revisions. And I had a question and Gina, maybe you can answer it for us. Um, we had two attachments. And one of the attachments had board policy, I believe it was 0460, and it was an A to I. And the other attachment had board policy 0460, A to, I think it was F or E. So it was the same board policy, but it, one was, had more things, more items on it. So then I got... Yeah, I, don't, I don't think any of them were ARs. See, I didn't get two packets, so I was really uh, confused I just about have one. that. Yeah. I just have one. On, on have agenda two. online, there's oh, two. On agenda two. online, yes, there is two. There's one that is for the board 
only, and it has the notes from CSBA's legal team. Yes. Yeah. The other one is for the public, which does not include the notes from legal counsels. But again, when I got to that one, and, and they were had different items on it. What number? I'm sorry, Linda. Just it was zero four sixty. Right. And one was A to I, and the other one was like so we'll A to have F to or look something. Look at that before next time. But just I'm glad Gina said that. That um, the one that comes for your eyes only is based on legal counsel's recommendation that we that those legal uh, notations are confident, confidential. The other packet is for the public, but we're going to have to look at that before we bring them back. I couldn't take it much out. to confuse me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, any questions on any of the board policies? Yes, Trustee Good. Well, look, looking at uh, a few of these, there are optional policies, and and I'm wondering if, for a sense of practicality unless it serves a particular district purpose, why would why should we adopt these? I mean, we have administrative regulations, and we have board policies, and I, I would defy anyone to quote scripture what any of these board policies says. So why would we add to our plate when it's not necessary? It's optional. And, and I have a few comments about a specific, a couple of these. Uh, the first is on page 16, and by the way, it's. It's awesome now that these yeah, are numbered, page so everybody can look at and look at the same thing. This is on district and school websites. This is an optional policy. I question whether we have the actual ability to do this. Um, it, do we have district design standards for our no. websites? No, we don't. That it's a requirement of this policy, and we also have are supposed to have uh, content guidelines, and are supposed to assign staff to review and approve prove these, and that includes not just the district's website, but the school websites. So as a practical matter, this is a good example of an optional policy. I think we should just say pass on, because we don't have the ability to do it. And more than pass, remove it, the, the existing one that we've already yes, got. Yes, absolutely. You already yeah. have it, right? Yeah. That would, be, that would be. So you're recommending, and we'd see if the board agrees, board policy 113 be removed? One 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 three. One 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 three B. A. Eleven thirteen. A. Right. Page six. Probably the whole thing. Or Probably the whole, the whole thing. thing. Yeah. D. Yeah. A through D or okay. A through D. The whole thing. Now it, it seems like the state okay. law changed, and that's why it was updated. So do it. The state law. Is that? It's still an optional, the following optional policy. Yeah, so, you know, I probably will have to talk with yeah. our legal counsel because we have certain obligations for people who are disabled, and I don't. I want to make sure we're not we're not taking something away that we have to do. So right. let me talk to our legal counsel about this. And I like the prohibiting website owners from using website information to build a profile about a student and engage in targeted advertising. I like that that's prohibited by this. Well, we can do that just generally. And we probably already have, probably in some other board policy, it prevents mm -hmm. that. It just may not say websites, but all advertising. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, it's not just advertising. It's well, this is first reading, so that's yeah. what this is for. So I'll talk to our legal counsel. The next one I have is against an optional policy, and that starts on page 21. Let's say a lease of district-owned real property. Well, we go, we go by the law when this occurs. I don't. Again, I don't think we need to have this in, in our board policies. So I would it'd be my recommendation to not include it, and if we have one currently, to do away with it. That's another one to look into, mm -hmm. 3280. And then the last one is on page 29 uh, under 3513.4A. And I'm, and I'm not sure, this is, it doesn't say optional, but I'm not sure that in the red language it says alcoholic beverages and what's crossed off at the bottom, unless approved by the superintendent or designee for limited purposes specified in B&P code section, et cetera. So what's our current policy? 
don't we allow we what is our current situation we don't allow alcohol at all. currently okay no. do you know why this but language is, is crossed off uh, there was a change in ed code as you know it's probably referenced there and you can have a board policy that allows the sale of alcohol so why would we not want to allow the superintendent to approve it that, that would be a big step that would be a big change well yeah but I mean, there, there may be, there may be the a board. valid reason for it. Like what? Give, a, fun, a, a, a large fundraiser, one of our facilities with adults only. A lot of schools. You can't that. you can't have any students at the event. Right. Uh, I gave you all a copy yeah. of the law when it changed. Yes. Mm -hmm. So it has to be adults only. No, I, I just I just wouldn't want to hamstring or handcuff or limit future boards at a, at a when, at, for a scenario where it might be appropriate or a good idea. If we open that door, do we want to? Are there rules that we we want? Do we? There are like some. Like to agree to that before. We there are some districts that are doing it, so that, I could look at, at their at board the minimum policy. We need to, yeah. It, and the minimum is sufficient. Yeah, and we've never we've never done it, but there might be a, a situation where we're doing the first. This sure. is just, I, this this yes. is just. I interpret this, or I look at this, and it looks like we we did allow the superintendent, and now we're not allowing her. No, I th I haven't had that ability. You did, last time we discussed it, the board didn't want didn't want to uh, have a policy well, that allowed if three, alcohol. If the red line is correct, then that wording was in there. Right. Unless yellow means new, but how can you redline something that's new? Right. I don't know. The yellow highlights our PSPA's changes. The the red. <coughs> district change and it could be if it's yellow highlighted it's a district change to CSBA's so, policy. so CSBA allowed the unless approved language right. but locally was decided to strike that right. right last time we discussed this you did not want us allowing alcohol on district property yeah I'm, I'm just bringing it up for discussion Well, I know it's interesting. This is coming up on my superintendent's list serve this week. A superintendent asked the question, how many of you allow alcohol to be sold? There were about 15 responses, and I think one or two said they're allowing it. I could get a, get a hold of there. Sold or? Uh, well, not sold, okay. having an event. So yeah. one of them gave an example of a large fundraiser mm -hmm. that they allowed. That would be the only. Yeah, was served. That'd be the only scenario where I can envision right. it, it would be, uh, you know, okay. Mm -hmm. so, so you do want to set rules. Huh? It has to be a school-related event. Well, that, that's that's for me personally. Right. That's for the board to decide. That's above the minimum. I think the district is. So do we want to codify what our district rules are? Do you want me to get hold of uh, a couple of districts' policies where they're doing it? So well, let's, let's see if there's see enough interest like. in looking into it. If there's not, then we'll just leave it as it is. Okay. Well, I have a question of Alvaro, I guess, is do we have um, requests from community to use our um, facilities, it would be a use of facilities, for events where they would want to serve alcohol? Um, I can double check, but there's no pending requests that I'm aware of or that I've denied on this grounds. Um, I do have to say I will go back to our insurance and modify our coverage if that's the will of the board. And coincidentally, the two SPAC members will remember this. Our, one of our high schools brought this up at our last SPAC meeting. They would like to be able to have fundraisers with alcohol. So this was the high school reps asking. It comes up at a lot of parent club meetings that if they were able to do it at the school sites, they could save a lot of money, where right now they're having to pay for venues, and no. that, that takes a lot of their profits. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, the Chipino fee that Gary High used to have would be an example. Well, and even I'm looking at, well, at renting out our facilities. I mean, not even for our own fundraisers. Right. But for example, the student center at Gary High is a beautiful facility. Perfect wedding venue. Exactly. <laughs> so if somebody wanted to rent that and serve alcohol, it would be a nice little 
perhaps, unless our insurance rates go up so much that it offsets. Or our, our, the use of the facilities is right. detrimental. We do have to have security for these kinds of events. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and we have to charge back. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. It wouldn't come out of our pocket. Trustee uh, Rosso. Being an early adopter, uh, I think the liability issues are huge. Um, I think that, you know, in other words, just one incident mm -hmm. on our campus, you know, somebody leaves from an event and has a problem. Uh, mm -hmm. Just the presence that it sets these facilities are for our students. Uh, these facilities are for our students. I, I'm not for early adopting this concept. Uh, I. I think there's, you know, we have plenty of uses and, and needs that we're doing. I think we can be innovative. I'm, I'm not anxious to be the first adopter. I, I'd like to kind of see how it's going out there, see how it's being received, and then, you know, maybe we visit it down the line, or you guys visit it down the line. <laughs> <laughs> so it won't Thank be on you. my. It Trustee won't be on Russo. My, is, is this a real election announcement? <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations, Mr. Yeah. We'll, well, pass, well, pass the buck to the next board. So Dr. Flores has suggested that she could look at some board policies of well, districts I, that are I, using I, it. I know two superintendents right. responded saying that they're doing it so I could see what their board policies look yeah. like. I'm that, bringing it back. Is that okay with the board? Or do we want to just put a kibosh on it, it now it, and it, not well, I'm, it's okay. I'm with Jaime. Okay. Yeah, I think we should take a head count so we don't wait to spin our wheels. Exactly. That's let's, where let's two I am. Against. We have two more against. I'm open to the idea if we learn what to do and what not to do. I'm against it. Okay, so one, two, three. Oh, I'm for it. Heather, four? four? I'm, I'm for it. For it. <laughs> not, not I'm for it. I'm for it, yes. <laughs> so, so F-O-R, not F-O-U-R. Okay, got it. <laughs> okay, I'd like to explore it, I'm, you right. know, at this point. I'm not sh sure where I am, but mm -hmm. I certainly don't want it to... Um, expose us to anything either. Right. So let's take a look at it and see. Yeah, I'd, I'd appreciate some legal counsel on this. Absolutely. Because one of our responsibilities as a board is to watch out for the district, protect the district. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I would just like some legal counsel on this, please. Okay. Especially okay. the liability part of it. Yep. And insurance. I agree. And insurance. Okay, so that's uh, 3513.4. And those are all the comments I had. Okay, James Pace. Uh, on page 22 at the bottom, there's a, a box, and it, it says uh, the sale, I, I guess if we strike this one for Mark's discussion, but if we keep it, uh, the sale lease of property is, is exempt from detailed CEQA review. The word detailed confuses me. I want... If we're exempt from CEQA, we're exempt from CEQA. So get rid of the word detailed. If we keep it. Mark's suggesting we get rid of this language, but we don't know if we can. So yeah, this, right, right. Well, this is stuff. optional. We'll have to. <laughs> sure. So we'll explore I think that. we have to have a board policy can. about the sale, sale or, or lease. lease of district-owned real estate. So I, mean, I, I need to follow up on this one. It's, yeah, it says optional, but it seems weird that it would be optional. But Well, I think it's optional. It's a board policy. The, the law is, there are volumes of the law on what we can and cannot do. I think having a board policy when we don't have to have one is superfluous. Okay. Agreed. Any other questions or comments about any board policies? Okay, so this is the first. Oh. Yeah, I know this is the first reading, so I would just suggest, can't we do this, that those of us who get hard copies... Just take it out and take it home and keep it. Why should Gina print this again in two weeks? Yeah. Can't we do that? Or I'll give Gina my copy and you okay, can give it back to give me. It to her. <laughs> yeah, I, go for, I go for that because the odds of me finding this again. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, I just look at it online. Just some way to recycle it, you know. It, it's very When you're reviewing a Thank document. You for saving pieces of paper. <laughs> yeah, it's almost impossible <laughs> to actually accurately review a document this size and make notations, at least for me. Yeah. I can't do it I can't online. Either. But Gina, could we just leave it in our binder then? And if yeah, I'll, I'll you'll just, okay, great. Thank you. Put your name on it. <laughs> so on to item number seven, board members reports. 
Going to some meetings and stuff. <laughs> yeah. We did some stuff. Is there any... Uh... Oh, Linda. Yeah. Yes. Linda and BC and I <clears throat> went to the um, Rotary presentations at the Elks Lodge on Tuesday. Yeah, well, $51,000 worth of awards were given to different programs in our district. So uh, it, was, it was great. I mean, they're very generous. And I thought it was so neat that the, the teachers who had applied for these grants were there. And received them, and they were recognized. You know, a lot of teachers work in isolation. They just don't get out much. <laughs> so it was really nice to see that that recognition by Rotary. Yeah, so. it was really nice. Yeah. I agree. Very generous. Anybody mm -hmm. else? Okay. So now, do we have any um, upcoming... Agendas? Yes. Um, maybe this isn't the right place, but uh, it's time again for the superintendent evaluation. I'll be sending that out shortly. Okay. Uh, I think we're setting the deadline of turning it in next Thursday, so I'll send it out this weekend or tomorrow or the next day. Thank so you. thank you. Good. Thank and you thank you for doing that. Yeah. Yeah. And it's such a great format. Thank you again. Yeah, he's done a really good job with that. I have to create a new one for the characteristic. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you're getting rid of a lot of those. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else have an agenda item you'd like to discuss? Okay, hearing none. Announcements. The next regular meeting of the Board of Education will be held Thursday, February 15th, right here uh, at 5.30, followed by a regular meeting at 7 o'clock. The agenda will be available on the district's website at 5 p.m. Friday, February 7th. Yes, Mr. Rasa. Uh, just wondering, uh, Debbie, you had uh, we had asked about the walk for the Alexander Station. You referenced that you had talked to the city and that you were going to get some feedback back to us about some development. Um, I'm wondering if you could send something in a, in a follow up on that. Sure. Because I'm. Well, we're meeting with them. Um, is it next Tuesday morning or the following Tuesday morning? I can bring it up again. I There's know. some reluctance on the part of the city to do the walkthrough. Why? But we also talked about instead of it being an Alexander walkthrough, which right. all of our walkthroughs are school related. I mean, our school based, so mm -hmm. it should be an Elliot. Well, oh, that's fine. Walk Elliot, okay. That's what it is. Yeah. Yeah. It's exactly. It's so, Elliot. so I was Start planning. To I was okay. planning to recommend that at our next meeting with the mayor and the city administrator. And I know the vice Chad with the Bicycle Walk Commission right. mm -hmm. is very motivated mm -hmm. about, you know, in other words, pushing city members, you know, to get this done. And I'm very motivated about it. I'd like to see it happen. I know it, it's been a great experience when we've done it. And in this particular case, I think it's, it would be great that we kind of take a look now as things are developing and see what needs to be done and what can be done. So it's a school as opposed to... Right, as yeah. a school. That's fine. But, I mean, yep. our partner is the city, right? I mean, we want them to be part of that. Sure. Anything else? We are adjourned. Yes.